Hi, and welcome to Habits for Humans, the podcast that explores what makes people tick and how to get this brain of ours to do what we want it to do. I'm your host, Kim Flynn, and today we're going to talk to Milton McClellan, uh, someone I consider a good friend of mine. I've known you for years and all around a uh, funny guy, very vulnerable guy, and just leads with his heart. He's a sweetheart. So um, we're going to talk about how using internal family systems can help us overcome perfectionism. So Milt, this is a topic I know nothing about. I have no perfectionism running in my body at all. <laughs> it's never shown either. It's, it's never shown, <laughs> yeah. And here's how to tell. Here's, here's, the, here's the tell of perfectionism. Um, so I'm on a pre-call with uh, Milt for this podcast. This is a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I open up to him and share like, you know, my life has been different the past couple of years. It's been really hard. And then I get off the phone and he's so compassionate and so loving. It's like he's a therapist or something, which he is. And so um, he's so comp- he's so compassionate, loving, has, you know, leaves so much space for me to be in that vulnerable space. I hang up the phone immediately like vulnerability hangover, like, oh, what did I just do? I just showed weakness, right? Like in that moment, there's perfectionism coming out. And I realized after, Mil, when I do that, and I'm going to just psychoanalyze myself for a second. When I do that, I'm going into a space of not trusting others that they can hold space for my weaknesses, right? So I am so excited to get into this with you um, and, and to really talk about overcoming perfectionism. I almost hate that word perfectionism because sometimes we don't relate to it. Um, and so if you're, if you're open to any other words, uh, having to show up always in a great space, having to show up beautiful and having a great family and having a great career and always looking nice, that's, that's what we're talking about today. Um, so Milt is a mental health therapist and he says in his bio, who Kim made an entrepreneur <laughs> with his therapist wife. And they work to help those who struggle with trauma, find healing and recovery. They have two great kids and live in Cedar City, Utah. And their business has just exploded the past couple of years. I've been so impressed watching from the sidelines as you just uh, really grow your business. So we have a giveaway for our listeners at the end. If you like stay uh, free stuff, stay tuned to the end. And also a word from our sponsor, Habits for Humans is brought to you by Retreat Works. We train you how to add high-end retreats to your coaching or wellness business, and you can add 50K in sales to your business while traveling the world. Who wouldn't want to do that, right? So welcome, Milt. The very first question I have for you, we always start the podcast with, what is your number one habit to manage your own mental wellness? What practice uh, do you do to manage the daily stress of life? I, Kim, first and foremost, thanks for having me. It's always good to talk to you. You're, you're one of my favorite people. So, and, and if you'll allow me, I have a special photo of remembrance that I think you'll fully enjoy down the road. We can share it in the, in the uh, comments or whatnot later. Um, one of our good days back at East Simplified. Um, you have a, a photo of remembrance? Is that what you said? Yeah, I have a photo of, a, of an activity we did and you will just laugh hysterically. Well, I'm dying so to it, see it. Do, it. do you have it? Can we pull it up on the screen or anything? I, I, I have it on, well, you know, like it's probably, of course, I just dropped my phone. I can, uh, if you give me sharing rights, I can show you the photo real quick. Okay, yeah. Just to give you an idea, this is what Kim convinced us to do, to try to become the best entrepreneurs we could be. <laughs> I think you so, could just take over sharing. Uh, do you have access? I think so. Let me, let me, nope, the host only has. Okay, go ahead. Now I just gave it to you now. Try Perfect. Let me pull this up. Let's share my screen real quick. <laughs> And those of you listening, I will describe the picture to you in all of its gory detail. So uh-huh. <laughs> right now we're seeing Milt's screen, all his personal stuff is up there, you know. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> so it says wanted by police, uh, police department bad boy, and Milt is wearing like some, uh, you know, really cool star glasses and uh, <laughs> and rocking out his feather boa. I love it. I had to buy these items from Kim with my entrepreneur bucks <laughs> that we had to use. So we were high rolling it back then. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. All right. Good days. Good days. So, right. Take it away. So to your cool. question, well, let me give you a little background on, on me a little bit and, and then that'll kind of answer the question of what I do. 
Um, so I've been a therapist now for 10 years. Um, we are heading into our 11th year. My wife and I started Roots Counseling in 2016. It's just kind of a part-time business. Uh, and then we got talked into jumping ship and going full-time. And it's been one of the best decisions we've ever made with everything that comes with it. As hard as it is, it has been worth it to ride it, to be the captain of our own ships, if you will. The, the therapy that we kind of started with is called dialectical behavior therapy. It's, it's in what they call a mindfulness-based space. So it's, we do a ton of mindfulness work every day. And that's a series of meditations or even doing something as silly as the hokey pokey and just paying attention to what it feels like in your body as you let loose a little bit and do craziness that no one really is ever going to care that you did. So any kind of things like that in a day, those are the things that I focus on the most. In my morning, I try to give myself about 10 to 15 minutes to really just kind of be quiet and settle and just be okay. Because I know the day is going to come, right? I mean, there's no, you can't stop it. I've tried and, I, and I've tried hiding in my bed. It's not the best answer, although it is nice sometimes. Everyone needs a mental health day. Um, and if anyone needs a letter, just let me know. I'll write you a, a letter for your mental health day. Um, those days are important. And we still have to go out and do what we got to do. So give yourself 15 minutes just to start the day and just do something that works for you. For me, it's meditation and scripture study. For other people, it's things like that. But it just sets your mind kind of on the right track. Let's, let's dive into being a therapist then. So we're talking that the point of this podcast is internal family systems um, to overcome perfectionism or that need to just look great in all areas of your life. Yeah. And you talked about dialectal behavior therapy as well, as well as mindfulness. How, how do you as a therapist even choose which lane of like theory you want to go down? You just try all of it and see what's what, what <laughs> <laughs> well. It is, sometimes it does feel like you just grab all of it and throw it against the wall and see what sticks. Um, we started, so we went through the University of Phoenix's program um, up in Salt Lake, and it was a great program, but it was very focused on what they call cognitive behavior therapy. That's kind of the Dr. Phil version of therapy. Everyone kind of, if you've watched him, you've seen him kind of confront people and like, well, what's your thinking? And how did that thinking start? And do you want to carry on the behavior to keep getting the same consequences? Or do you want to change the behavior to get a different consequence? That's the real basic model, ABC, activating events, behavior and belief and consequences. That's kind of been the, the Cadillac of treatment forever. I started working at a residential program right when I started grad school and they were a DBT program. So I just started reading through these skills and, and dialectical behavior therapy is a Western therapy. So all the behavior stuff mixed with Eastern Buddhist philosophy. So you've got these two worlds that combine. And I just loved what I was reading. And, and for me, it accentuated all of my beliefs. And not just my, my therapy beliefs, but my personal beliefs as well. So it, it, I think if you're going to do therapy effectively, you have to find the model that kind of accentuates your values. The research is pretty clear. 90% of therapy has nothing to do with the system we use. 90% of it is this, the, the connecting with each other. And if that connection works and the therapist stays consistent with his model or her model, then it works. Wow. So sadly, the biggest part of therapy is not the amount that I spent on school. <laughs> the biggest part of therapy is, can you and I connect? Is there trust there? When things go wrong, is, is it repairable? And, and then this becomes the relationship you get to practice with because there's no real consequence if you break up with me there's only a consequence in your real life when you break up with people that you're connected to. So we get to practice with us. And if that trust is there and we use a model, it can work. That's really fascinating. I never realized that it has nothing to do with what you do. It's nothing to do with your training. It's, uh, it's can you connect? Can you connect with the person? I wonder if there are some, uh, some, some, <laughs> some times when that is not true though, when the person has no idea what they're doing and they're lovely. <laughs> I'm just trying to throw so, a wrench in your model here. So, so sadly, there's no way to really tell if a therapist is good or bad until you meet with them. That's that's one of the things that I think is really frustrating about the process. And that's why I think it's important for, for us therapists to get up in front of the world and, and show the world who we are. Because we need to be judged in the world just like every other business is. Mm -hmm. But the kind of standard, because we've all got a license from the state that we work in, it's almost like we've got this check mark that says, yep, you're good. And 
And insurance companies don't validate whether you're good or not. And basically, if you don't have any complaints, it's assumed that you're good. And that's not really a great model. I'm not a real big fan of that model. I want to compete. I want to show everyone that I, I can help you. I want to earn your business. And I want to be able to prove that we're in this fight with you. We're not just here, come sit at my feet and, and, and let me imbue my guru knowledge into you. I don't, I don't want to do that. I've never been really good at that anyway. I do like having all the answers. That's kind of one of my personality traits that I get to work on, so. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so real question for you. If 90% of the results you get from therapy um, come from the relationship, why isn't, why can't we just talk to our friends and get the same results? I think that the 10% can matter in that regard because the fact that we do study out trauma, the fact that we study out the brain, the fact that we study out how the systems work together and, and and we'll get into this with internal family systems. The fact that we've spent the time and the training in this stuff gives us a leg up and say your friend. It's not that your friend doesn't have a lot of great tools for you and your friend can be a great asset to you, but they also have a bias. If they're your friend, they're with you already. You come into my world and I don't necessarily have a bias against you. And I say necessarily because we all have natural biases. So I'm not going to say I've never had never any biases towards any of my clients. That's just not true. And I don't have anything to lose or gain by telling you something that I'm observing. It's not to help strengthen the, the, the friendship or I don't have any way to like, you're not gonna come and move my couch on a Saturday because we're friends or we're in a therapeutic relationship. So I can tell you things that say might not happen in a friendship that you need to hear and can challenge you in ways that are beneficial. And the fact that we don't have the history makes a difference too, because you know it's a, a cleaner slate that it's coming from, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I like that, a cleaner slate. Yeah, that does make sense. All right, so let's dive in. We've talked a little bit about dialectal behavior therapy. I love the idea of that. West means meets East. Yeah. Uh, we are so freaking sick of cognitive behavior therapy. I'll, I'll speak for the whole you know world on that one. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Let's talk about internal family systems. This is something that I just heard of maybe a year or two ago uh, as a friend of mine was going through um, this. And then I read a book about it and I was like, oh, this is actually really cool. Um, will you kind of give us the, the nutshell of how it works? So the founder, uh, Richard Schwartz or Dick Schwartz is what he goes by, is a marriage and family therapist. Marriage and family therapy is very different than how I was trained. Okay. Marriage and family therapy deals a lot more with the outside world. And in the outside world, we try to look at how the system's interacting. The way I was trained was to look at the person's inner world and try to figure out how that's connecting. So Richard's doing all this stuff and, and has always had a passion for helping people. He, his dad worked at a hospital and he ended up doing a, his internship hours during the summer and whatnot, working on the behavioral health unit. And his dad was a doctor. So he sat through these people who were going through like the worst of the worst experiences, right? You show up to the, to the hospital with a mental health emergency. It's not a good day. So he, he grew a, a huge compassion for these clients, went into the, the marriage and family health field, and he tried <clears throat> all of the, the techniques that are supposed to help people who have bulimia and anorexia uh, eating disorders, and also had a lot of self-harming suicidality issues. And the, the story that kind of pushed this forward in Richard's uh, books that he talks about is he was working with a girl he'd worked with for a long time, and this girl had a self-harming problem, and she was, she was cutting. And they worked with this part, and they did a, a therapy called Gestalt therapy, and they used a technique called empty chair technique. So they sat two chairs facing each other, and the girl would bounce back between her and the part that was cutting. And Richard, and when the girl was in herself side, as opposed to the cutting person side, they worked with this girl for like two hours in a session and just talked with this empty chair of this other part of her, if you will, not even recognizing that this is the, the start of his therapeutic journey into this parts world. And they built this safety contract that said, we're not gonna cut anymore. And everyone walks out feeling like, yay, we did it. And the girl comes back to therapy the next week with a giant cut down her face. And Richard throws himself into his chair and says, I give up. 
I clearly don't know what I'm doing here. And the girl responding from the self-harming part says, finally, now will you listen to me? Wow. And Richard's like, okay. And all of a sudden he started realizing that all the outward systems that he was seeing in these family dynamics was and had been playing out in his clients the whole time. And so he started developing this system around it, this theory around it. And his theory has basically three components. There are, sure kid. Before, before we get into the nuts and bolts though, I just have to like stop and respond to that. That's such a wow moment. So the goal isn't to shut down that bad part of you. The goal is to listen to that part of you that's causing harm, yeah? In fact, his book is called No Bad Parts. And wow. the philosophy is any part, no matter what they're doing, even if it's clearly damaging, ineffective, whatever, there is a function that this part, there's a message this part is trying to convey. And if we can connect with that part, we can, one, build a deeper connection with ourselves. Our parts start to trust us more. And then we grow into the person we want to be. Instead of fighting ourselves, we're building ourselves up from the inside out. And I love, I love that. Wow, concept. this That's is so really beautiful. powerful. You, you explain it really, really clearly. So I appreciate that. I have to share with you before you go into your three steps or three parts, um, I have to share with you kind of how I play with this in my life. So in my life, I imagine, do you know Edna from uh, The Incredibles, the really short lady uh -huh. with dark hair, the, the no capes, that lady? So <laughs> <laughs> I actually imagine her when I'm like in freak out mode or I'm scared or I'm whatever else, I imagine her in like this, you know, in, in the classic movie, the big white, uh, you know, expanse of nothing. And then there is a stool and on that stool, Edna sits. And I watch when I'm trying to get a hold of what, what, what's, what am I feeling right now? I just watch Edna and she like runs around like a crazy person sometimes. She like crawls into bed, covers over her bed, her head and just wants to cry. Like it's, it's really helpful to be able to look at this other part mm -hmm. of you and what they're doing. I also have identified one other person. <laughs> this is embarrassing, but I don't think I've ever revealed myself like this. <laughs> the other well, I'll show you a picture of my part after oh, we're I done. Love I it. Had, picture. It's so great, yeah. Oh, I love it. Okay, my other part is when I'm feeling really connected to my husband and I'm in this like loving space. Um, what's the movie of like the cartoon girl from Disney, but it's, it's in, she's in real life. Do you know her? Oh, uh, Enchanted. Yeah, enchanted. That like yeah. sweet, like little, uh, like <laughs> uber, uber feminine and not very, yeah. very naive. You know that kind of thing. So those are the two parts that I have running in me. We've got enchanted and Edna, both, both uh, uh, <laughs> cartoon figures. Anyway, I love it. Those are awesome parts, and <laughs> and I love what you said about that most is you actually can see what they're doing, mm -hmm. and you can see the function of, of how they and why they exist in your system. Yeah. Did I just lose you? Where'd you go, Milt? Are you still here? Let me text you. Oh, there you are. Okay, we'll, we'll start over. So I, that, that phrase ended nicely, so we didn't lose you for too long, so. <laughs> I was, uh, technology, gotta love it. I was just adjusting <laughs> my headphones, I promise. <laughs> You're good. Um, I love what you described in that, that, that they, you can see the function of those parts and, and you can see that you have a relationship with it. Now, what IFS does is actually has you connect with those parts and actually has you interact with them in a way that, that is useful so that you can understand and deepen that relationship. More importantly, discover why they took on the job they did. And that's the piece that I love the most. So, so in DBT, it's, it's actually kind of, this has been one of the issues I've had with DBT the 10 years that I've been doing it is, we function as a squashing therapy. It's a behaviorist therapy. So we're trying to eliminate all the negative behaviors in your life. IFS says, turn towards those behaviors, connect with them, see if we can help them grow out of the behavior that's causing us problems and then grow into the job they want to have. That to me is like the perfect metaphor of life that we're growing into the version of us that we want to. One wow. of the... One of the things that Buddha would talk about sometimes is we can't always project, you know, a higher power, but we can see who we want to be in 10 years, you know, or five years or whatever. And this is kind of a common practice, right? You know, you, you aim for the, the person you want to be. 
Well, the parts will tell you if that's who you actually want to be or not, or if it's a part that's trying to drive that versus the system trying to drive that. And then you can change your priorities in the way you're doing life based on the understanding of is, is it one part that's driving it and that part's been dominant versus me listening to my whole system and saying, okay, am I making the right decision? Am I making the decision as the self to go towards this person that I want to be? And that to me is empowering because ultimately this process gets me to be fired. And I want people to fire me. I want them to walk away from therapy feeling like they've got the tools they need now to make adjustments even when new things come up. You know, or if they need just a little help, they can come in and get a little bit of help and not have to go into another year's worth of therapy. All right, so what I'm hearing is the first step is find and even label the parts. Are we talking like 20 different people in there? Are we talking about two or three? It depends, what, what are you looking for in this? So the answer is always gonna be yes, right? It depends on the person. Sometimes we're gonna see some dominant parts and sometimes we're gonna see a lot of ton of little parts that are running around. And the more I do this with clients, we, we spend a lot of time mapping and we'll draw them out or we'll write them out. And we actually try to track um, what the function of each part is, what the relationship between the parts are, which parts are aligned. And it's like the gang war, like inside of you, which parts are fighting on this side of you and which parts are fighting on that side of you. And are they really fighting or do they just believe they're fighting? So it's, it's, it's a deep process. And that's why I think they're again, going back to your friend question, your friend's not going to want to waste all this time with these things. Your friend just kind of wants to help you and move on. We take the time to kind of work through these things with you. And the other part that I love about IFS is they highlight coaches just as much as they do therapists. I don't think therapists have a, a, a special power that no one else has. I learned this stuff by reading and going to trainings. So I love the coaches that I've worked with in IFS too. Uh, I just finished up a 16-week training course in this, and there were half of the people there were coaches and half of them were therapists. And it was great to see the coach's perspective versus the therapist's perspective. So if you are looking for something like this in your life, you can use a coach and it works just as well. Really interesting. Okay. So again, step one, find label the part. I love that you're like, what is the function of each part? How long, how do they get along? Uh, mm -hmm. And do the whole like genealogy mapping of all these people. <laughs> <laughs> the genealogy right. of your system inside yeah. you. Oh, I love yeah. it. <laughs> that makes my heart flutter. I'm like, can we spreadsheet it as well? Like, can we put it yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> there is an Excel sheet waiting for you, Kim. <laughs> with like which percentage does Edna come out versus the, you know, the, the naive little girl <laughs> all right number two you connect with each part why they took on the job they did give us some more context on that how, how would we dive deeper into that so there's kind of the six f's is what they call them find uh focus on you're going to ask me to remember all of them no I'm not uh, fig figure out their fears um a lot of it is just kind of how do you build the the, the connection with them and focusing, connecting with, figuring out how old they are versus how old they think you are. It's interesting when you kind of work with a part that's like, I've got a, a child part that's around 10, that's my angry part. Um, and my angry part and I go way, way back. Um, that part was the part that protected me the most because I felt so unequal to everyone around me. We were dirt poor. Um, we, that in 1984, I happened to see my dad's social security statement about 15 years ago. And in 1984, a family of seven, we were making $10,000 a year. So less than $1,000 a month. And we were living off of government cheese and government peanut butter. Not as big of a fan of the cheese as I am with the peanut butter. That was pretty tasty stuff. Um, you know, we did the, the typical waiting on the, the, the porch for the mailman to come so we could get our food stamps because there was a game you could play with food stamps. You could go buy a nickel candy and then they'd have to give you 95 cents back because the, the stamps only came in increments of dollars, $5 and $10. So we'd get an allowance of like $3 and then we'd go buy three candies. And then we had $2 and 85 cents in change that we could go spend on whatever we wanted. And that was, that was the poor life that we lived. Um, you know, my clothes shopping was at the DI, not at the, you know, cool shops. Although my dad was nice enough to buy us new underwear, which we were always grateful for. No DI underwear. Um, and so I, I got angry as a kid 
and and I got angry about the situation we were in and I saw these other people having stuff and me not having things and this anger part really pushed me to be better now I have tons of, of learning disabilities I can't write worth worth beans um, my grammar is still in the fourth and fifth grade level although thank god grammarly exists so I sound a lot more intelligent now um, I actually didn't go into resource classes because I watched my brothers get teased so mercilessly that I refused to to not pass those tests so my anger actually focused me so hard on those tests that they give you to get into resource that I passed them with flying colors but then doing all the other school work I was awful so I was a horrible student throughout high school um in my bachelor's degree it took me 10 years but if I didn't have that anger part I wouldn't have kept going so that anger part has been my, weirdly, my biggest cheerleader. You can fight through this and no obstacle is gonna stop you. The downside of it has been, I've been the quickest to fight with people. I'm so raw sometimes that I get into arguments with people. And that was the way that I, I would protect myself because I wasn't physically strong ever. I, I got bullied in, in fifth grade and, and a lot in seventh grade. And, I knew how to be witty. So if I could disarm you with words, knowing that I wasn't gonna ever take you physically, I, I, even though I was getting beat up, I felt like I won. It, do you see how these parts like create this weird narrative, this story that they tell you so that you can keep moving forward? And that's what I did is I, I became witty. I became really sarcastic and funny. Do you know who gets beat up less? The funny guy in the classroom. So I became the funny guy. So then out of this anger part comes my funny guy part. And, and so you can see how they start evolving into other parts as well. And that was, that was what pushed me. In fact, my, my debate coach in high school told me I was never going to be a psychiatrist because she knew how much I worked at writing and reading and all of that kind of stuff because she was my English teacher too. And she passed me by just to get me through classes because heaven knows she had to read my papers and they were awful. Um, and she wasn't saying that to be mean. She was saying that because Milt, you're gonna have to write a ton and you don't have those skills right now. My angry part took that and said, oh yeah, I'll prove it, which is great. So I don't need to be mad at her because she told me something. I can understand how that part took that information and used it as fuel to push me forward. I took 10 years to get my bachelor's degree, 10 years. I changed so many times, it's not even funny. This part is the part that kept me going. And then when I finally got my master's and this part kind of got to do a sigh of relief, it was like, who do I fight now? You, you kind of got there. And I got my job and nearly lost my first therapy job <laughs> because that was a whole story. And it just all these things. So this, this part tried to come out in different ways and we weren't exactly meshing. And I've had some great conversations with it over the last you know, little while as we've worked through the IFS model because to do the IFS, you have to be in IFS therapy, which is, I think is awesome. Um, we've had some great conversations of why he's still responding the way he is. And this part is a he, and that's where it gets interesting. Is the parts get to decide their gender. They get to decide their names. They get to decide everything. Even the fact that they look like Edna from, you know, The Incredibles, <laughs> um, which I love. Um, in fact, my, when I show you my inside out head, I've got all my characters. Donald is my anchor and you've got the fire coming out of his head. It's awesome. Um, I, I needed that to get to where I am, but I don't need that same energy to keep going where I am. I need a different energy. So this part and I need to evolve into a different state. Wow. So, so much there. Like that was, sorry, like dinner. That, was a, that was a whole meal within itself. There's so many questions I have for you. Um, just to recap though, first of all, um, we're trying to find what they're trying to tell us, what they're trying to teach us, right? And I love your example of Donald and the anger. Are we trying to find the good? I don't, I hate to make that, you know, binary, this is good, this is bad, but we're trying to find what the function is that can mm -hmm. help us, is that right? Are they ever just purely destructive or does every piece have something that can help us? Every part believes they're helping the system. Ah, uh, okay. That's where it, it starts and stops. And, and it's the way you get healthy is the parts connect with the self, the per, pure version of you. So the answer is good or bad is kind of a, an arbitrary term because it's, it's 
it's so about what works for you and what works for other people, right? So if this part is damaging in some ways, like sometimes my angry part was very cutting and that would damage relationships. And that's not effective. That's not helpful in the long run. It would hurt um, relationships between my wife and me. It would hurt relationships between my, me and my kids. Um, in fact, there was a, a real big moment where I recognized this part was not helping me with my daughter. She came in and gave, you know, the perfect daughter moment. She, like 15, she comes in, we're running late for church. And she comes in and says, how can I help? Like every parent's dream, you recognize we're, we need help. And she goes and my wife says, make me breakfast, make me a bagel and put some cream cheese on it. And so she goes and does it. And I come out and I'm eating my breakfast at the table and um, she's smearing the bagel and she drops the, the knife and she says, oh shit. And I kind of stiffen up a little bit and I kind of pivot towards her and I look at her and I see just this utter fear on her face. It was the saddest moment I, I have had. And I, I reference this moment a lot because I want to remember it. Um, and I made a joke to get her to laugh. And then later on that day, I pulled her aside and I said, that look that you had when you dropped that knife and I looked at you and you were scared of me, I know I caused that. I know this anger part of me, I didn't have these words yet, but I know this anger part of me caused that. And I'm gonna work really hard to not ever to, for you to never have that look on your face again with me because that anger part was not nice all the time when he got home from work he was ornery at times mm -hmm. you know oh, so God, yeah making me cry <laughs> <laughs> and that's and i think that's the beauty of it is we they, they can grow just like we can grow so it's hanging on to a behavior that it's used since it was 10 mm -hmm. because that's what it knows well, I'm 45 now. If I'm still acting like a 10 year old with my anger, that's a problem for me. If it's not a problem for you, great. Good, good for you. And, and I hope your life is great. Mm -hmm. It's a problem for me. And so we have conversations all the time. So the, the part is never bad. And yet it can still engage in some things that are not good. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to apply this to my Edna. And Edna for sure isn't bad, but Edna has thought that she had to run the show for a very long time. Bless her heart, right? Yep. She's been working so hard and she's been thinking like, she's the one in charge. She has to, you know, make me successful and make me do all these things and make me look good and, and never mm -hmm. get hurt. And she's been feeling like she has to hold all of that. And it's been so nice to connect with that deeper part of me uh you know you hear it like the clouds and the and the sky right so edna is the clouds and just to be able to connect to your sky mm -hmm. and i go into that white that white space you know uh in the in the movie and i just sit next to her and i say let's let's just look at the stars together <laughs> let's just look at the stars <laughs> can i tell you what's beautiful about that yeah that's literally the healing process in ifs hmm. that's the exact process that we go through is is we sit with our parts as us, as our true self, mm -hmm. and we witness with them what they want us to see. Hmm. So you're actually doing, and this is what makes this so cool, is therapists don't ever discover anything, or therapists don't ever invent anything, we discover. There are so many stories just like what you described that people have turned towards that inner child